Welcome, everyone. My name is Irina Dumitrescu. Uh, I'm this year's Public Humanities Faculty Fellow at the Jackman Humanities Institute. Um, I'm usually a professor of medieval English at the University of Bonn, but I have the pleasure of being here uh, this year to talk about pleasure, in fact, which is our, our theme of the year. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to a panel called Writing Historical Women with Ruby Lal and Alison Keith. Some of you might have joined us Tuesday for my conversation on craft and public writing uh, with Ruby. And if so, this will be a continuation uh, for you. You will see some themes come up again, some new characters. Uh, if you weren't able to, to make it, uh, I have the happy news that it was recorded just as today's panel is being recorded and it should eventually find its way onto the Jackman Humanities Institute YouTube site, which I'm very excited about because not to put, not to redden Ruby's uh, cheeks already, but I, I'm hoping to just watch it all over again. Um, that is how much I enjoy it. So look out for that um, if you weren't here on Tuesday. And I just wanted to say, um, especially since Allison is here and that so many from the JHI are here, this has been a really rich year and a privilege to be here um, in Toronto, to be having these conversations in a kind of wider way, in a more expansive way than is usually possible in academe. Uh, and it's also my honor to, to be here in this moment of reflection um, about place and about history in a way that wasn't necessarily the case when I was growing up in Toronto. And to be able to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates and on which I now live. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work and to play and to bring my family to this land. So now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Ruby Lal uh, is an acclaimed historian of India and professor of South Asian studies at Emory University. Most recently, the author of Empress, the Astonishing Reign of Nur Jahan. There's one, one edition of the book, uh, which was a finalist in history for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and won the Georgia Author of the Year. She's currently at work on a new biography, Rebel Princess, The Great Adventures of Gulbadan for Yale University Press. And Alison Keith is professor of classics and director of the Jackman Humanities Institute here at the University of Toronto. She has published extensively on the intersection of gender and genre in Latin literature and Roman culture and society. Her current research focuses on the earliest extant Latin poetry attributed to a female author, Sulpicia and asks why Sulpicia remains completely unknown when Sappho was so famous both in antiquity and in later ages. Welcome, Ruby. Welcome, Alison. It's really great to have you both in one virtual place. So let me all remind you as, as you're listening to this that you can put in your, your questions into the chat at any time. I know it, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to warm up. And so that we warm up, I thought I would ask um, both of our panelists to just give us a little brief introduction to their current work and to especially to the woman um, who, who is the current obsession, the, uh, uh, the passion, the fascination of, of the day. Uh, Ruby, will you start us off? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you again, uh, Alison and Irina and the Institute. Um, I think these are these are life transforming conversations. And as I was saying to you earlier on that, you know, when do you get a chance with two amazing women to sit down and talk about our obsessions with quote unquote medieval women, right? So it's it's just such an such an honor to be doing this. Um, my current project um, is a biography of uh, Princess Gulbadan. But actually it is not current. I, I began my um, academic career with this, with this woman. Um, and just to, just to give you a sense of who she is and uh, why the obsession began almost 20, 21 years ago. Um, so I work on the Mughal dynasty of, of India, most famously known for the great Taj Mahal. Um, but of course, uh, as you might expect, my, my life journey 
um, has been to, to think the formidable matriarchs uh, in that lineage who had been written out of history. Um, and so this is my moment of immodesty to say that I actually ended up opening this, this um, you know, world of gender relations and feminist interventions uh, into thinking, thinking the grand Mughals of India. But I think the woman who allowed me to do that uh, was Gulbadan Bano Begum, literally Princess Rose Body. Uh, she was the daughter of the first uh, Mughal king of India. They were itinerant uh, peripatetic monarchs who came from Central Asia through Afghanistan into India. Uh, and she was the first a Mughal girl at age six to travel in a gorgeous caravan from Afghanistan into, into India. Uh, sister of the second king who then loses the empire, goes into exile and she migrates back to, to Afghanistan uh, and comes back to India uh, in the time of the third great Mughal of India. And we call him great because really essentially, actually his name is also great, Akbar the Great. So the great, the great. We are not surprised by historians doing this kind of act of the great and the great. Um, he's, the, he's the great essentially because he systemat systematizes the, the empire. He builds magnificent cities. So the opulence of the Mughal court that you, that you, that you envisage actually begins with him. And part of the action is, and this is the history I was you know, starting as a young graduate student, which became my first book actually, if I may. Uh, domesticity and power in the early Mughal world. Um, he builds the first set of stone walls in the empire, palaces, the first harem, women's quarters, into which all the multi-generational itinerant women are ordered to live, including by this time, this grand matriarch. So I knew this history and I, I wrote about all this in my, in my first book. Uh, the book ends at the time of this uh, injunction to women that they must live behind the walls. Um, and Gulbadan um, very uh, astutely, he's a, he's a, she's, a, she's a formidable matriarch by this time, she negotiates with her a nephew, the emperor, saying, you know, I've for a long time wanted to, to undertake the pilgrimage to the, to the Hijaz, to Western Arabia. Um, and of course, he has his own uh, incredible ambitions. He wants to be the millennial sovereign. The millennial is about to come. Of course, typically, you know, monarchs didn't travel that far. So she puts together a band of uh, amazing 13 women and set out, you know, she sets out from the harem onto the seas. So this is the history I wrote. Um, but by the time I was on the road uh, speaking with Empress, my, my latest biography of Noor Jahan, who's, who's a generation after Gulbadan and is a very different um, power wielding uh, woman. Um, by this time, uh, you know, uh, Noor Jahan comes into, into, into the worldview. I've shown in the book that um, Gulbadan is setting out on the seas. So people began to ask me, this is, this is my life story, people always ask me a question and that leads to a certain kind of invitation. People began to ask me on the road, um, lecture on the road. Um, what about Gulbadan? What was happening to her? Who is she? We want to know more. So I began to put my thoughts around it. And one of the reasons, and I'm just going to share a small um, image here with you. One of the things um, that Gulbadan does, and this is after she comes back uh, from, the, um, from, the, from the trip in Western, Western Arabia, Hijaz, her nephew is by this time even more profoundly ambitious. And he wants the first imperial history of the empire written. It would be called predictab predictably Akbar Nama, the Chronicle or the history of Akbar. And, he asks various people who had lived through the life and times of the former uh, emperors to write down something that would be a contribution to the imperial history. And there was only one woman he commissions, uh, you know, out of all of these people, and that is his auntie, which is Gulbadan. And she writes this um, chronicle. Uh, I 
was the last person to hold this. This is in the British Library, Oriental 166. It's very fragile. It's a gorgeous red book. It's now available in microfiche. Um, I was the last person to hold this, but more than the holding, and of course this you can see, I still have that slip uh, as, a, as a graduate student going there. And you know, in those days we, we picked up these uh, factual sort of, you know, very tactile ways of doing research. Um, the after at, at folio 83, the manuscript breaks off. So I mentioned this because this lacuna stayed with me. And when people started asking me about Gulbadan, my mind went to that. There was a second thing that started emerging to me, something that I hadn't paid, paid attention to earlier on, which is that the women and Gulbadan were in Western Arabia for about four and a half years. What is more in the imperial history itself, it's noted that she did not want to come back. Um, and when these two things came together, I thought to myself, something is happening here. Um, and I'll speak more about it, but you know, so I've come back to her three books down uh, and now I'm doing the, uh, a full, full length biography. Ruby, that's perfect. You've given us a suspense point to end on. <laughs> this is a perfect Dan Brown twist. <laughs> Why did Gulbadan not want to go back? <laughs> Stay tuned for the whole panel. <laughs> Thank you. Allison, you're up. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so a very difficult act to follow. Um, and I'll just say that I've worked on outgroups and muted groups in ancient Rome for my entire career, mostly through literature, um, a bit in uh, Roman culture and society. Um, and as Irina mentioned, I am currently writing a biography of the earliest extant uh, female Latin poet. I'm just going to share my screen um, to, uh, yes, to show my slide deck here. And um, I was invited to write this um, biography and every time I put in a proposal, it came back as too dry, too academic. Um, it needed to be more exciting. And finally, after I'd seen a couple of accepted proposals, I, um, I said to my partner, oh, I'm supposed to be writing a Harlequin romance. And so I have a jazzy, what I think of as a jazzy name, a title, Sulpicia, Roman poet of female passion. Um, mm -hmm. But we know about Sulpicia um, Servius' daughter from her signature in a poem that survives um, in a cycle of 11 poems exploring her amatory vicissitudes with a man named Corinthus. And these poems are actually included in the third book of the so-called Appendix Tibulliana, the Tibullan Corpus. This is a three book collection that circulated under the name of Tibullus traditionally regarded as the foremost Latin elegiac poet who lived and wrote in the early years of the first Roman emperor, Augustus. The first two books undoubtedly contain poetry by Tibullus, but the third book consists rather of a miscellany of Latin verse by authors apparently connected with Tibullus' patron, Marcus Valerius Massala Corvinus, whom Sulpicia actually addresses as her kinsman in another poem. So here, if anywhere in classical Latin literature, we would seem to gain unmediated access to the feelings and desires of a historical Roman woman. So the questions that animate my research really arise from the tantalizing circumstances of the transmission of this cycle of verse by and about Sulpicia, which comes to us within the Tibullan corpus. How did this book of poetry survive after the collapse of the Roman empire? How can we date its contents? Can we identify any woman actually named Sulpicia in the classical historical record who might've composed amatory elegy and erotic epigram in ancient Rome? What evidence is there anyway for historical Roman women's education and interest in, let alone authorship of Latin poetry and from what class might they come? At what point in her life course might a Roman woman have written poetry and how else could or should she have spent her time? 
with whom might she have shared her verse? Who might have written poetry about her? And who might have collected this cycle of poems? So that's the introduction to my <laughs> materials. Thank you, Alison. And it strikes me that we have, in one sense, a really kind of wide range between um, a woman writer who, who left very little that we still have, right? And who's in a sense, a, quite a, a bit of a mystery and the woman writer who left a really substantial amount of writing um, and, and whom we can place historically quite well. And yet we, I think some of the same issues involving contextualization and understanding what's left will, will come up. Um, we have a few questions in the chat already and, they, and they're, um, I think quite nicely um, lead us into, into some of the things I wanted to talk about anyway. Uh, Christine asks um, of Ruby, but I think it might make sense for all of us. How do you find traces of the women you write about? How do you balance evidence and imagination when writing about them? Um, so maybe Ruby could start us off and then we could, we could sort of pop in into that. Um, I think the question about imagination and evidence is a very critical one here. So, um, uh, you know, one of the central issues to, to, to just speak from this new biography that I'm writing. Um, first of all, though, before I, before I say that, the important uh, thing here in relationship to the question itself is, you know, when I began this work for the scholarly, when I began uh, studying her manuscript for my scholarly book, uh, historians, there was one historian in particular who, who, who said to me, uh, you know, how are you going to do this work on the what I called the domestic life of the of the early Mughals? We are no, there are no sources for it. Now it's an interesting thing that in 1902, a really splendid uh, translator called Annette Beveridge, actually her whole lifestyle is and her whole life story is so magnificent, which is going to be part of my biography, actually does the first uh, translation of the book, and this was available. Uh, and then beverages papers were available in the library, but it's a certain kind of marginalization uh, of the source itself, right? Uh, what I've subs subsequently called, and I've been writing about this male disbelief, right? That even when you have the sources, the, the imagination and that male imagination is that it doesn't exist. Uh, but to go, go back more pointedly uh, to, the, to the question that was just posed, uh, so, the, the, there are two things that, that undergird this biography. One is this, this very long obsession I've had about what happens to, 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 to women who are, um, who are devotedly itinerant, right? Um, and this woman is fully itinerant. I mean, she's always in caravans. The kind of life she lives is tented lifestyle, essentially. And we are not talking about little tents, we are talking about cities, tented cities in which 50 to you know, 200,000 people, so full kind of tented um, you know, lifestyle. She embodies that under her father, her brother. And then it's the emperor, her nephew, who's beginning all these stone things. So uh, I think part of the retort, part of wanting to go out had to do, you know, had to do with not being confined behind stone walls. Uh, so I think this is this is this is one part of the story, and this um, th th this has been very central because this is really the problem of the book, which is what happens when you when you when you put behind what do stone walls do? Uh, so till 1577, when she leaves uh, the empire, uh, unlike my other biography. Um, every act is gorgeously documented i've been able to. Uh, you know, partly because her father, Babur, the first Mughal, who was a poet and, a, and, and this kind of glorious observer, so different from the later monarchs, he has uh, one of the most stupendous biographies about, and of course it's called Babur Nama, the self, right? Um, but it's, but it's, it's an absolutely stunning record uh, of the times, so it allows things like you know, setting the scene of having a caravan that's coming from Afghanistan to India, early cities, what's happening, etc. Um, also documentation that through which, you know, I show her 
her life uh, in tented cities in India and then back to Kabul and then back again behind the walls. All of this is fine. The most exciting part for me was to chart what happened in those four and a half years in Western Arabia. And it literally begins with, you know, in 1578 with her setting out uh, on the sea in, in Western India from a place called Gujarat. Uh, that's the state, the city is called Surat and it was called the gateway to Mecca. So they're going to Mecca and Medina in, the, in, in Western Arabia. And uh, this is just one concrete example of you know, how I have done this latter half of the work without any evidence. So in the documents, it's mentioned, um, there was a Jesuit priest called uh, Antonio Monserrate, and he's a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, Italian Jesuit to the, to the court of Akbar the Great, to her nephew. Um, and he has one sentence in which he says uh, that, um, it was Gulbadan Begum who was able to negotiate with the Portuguese, give them the, ta give them the town of Butsaris and set out. Now that one line caught my attention and I thought, why would she give them the town of Butsaris? What was happening? And that led me to this glorious um, uh, investigation of the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea in which you know, the Portuguese are involved, the trading is involved. Uh, and of course, it, that one sentence allowed me to really completely set scenes. She had stayed a year in Surat before this embarkation, uh, sorry, before embarkation for the, for, the, for the Hijaz. Then what happened on the, on the journey? I was very intrigued by that till, you know, it took three months to get to, get to Red, Red Sea. I mean, these, we are talking the late, 16th century, 1578 or thereabouts. What did the ships look like? And so I began looking and there was one, literally one extract in a letter to Akbar the Great by uh, one of the officers who was leading this, this troop. He says that, you know, a child fell into the, into the sea. So I became very obsessed with sea monsters and what did the sea look like. And so this is again, I'm, I'm you know, giving you chapter by chapter account, uh, but really what happened in Arabia was the big question. So again, you know, what people do by way of pilgrimage in, in Western Arabia, most of the accounts are from 19th century. I wanted to dig deeper into what did it mean to be in a desert in 16th century. And it's possible to do that because I got into parallel historiography such as you know, what the Ottomans were writing. The whole area was under the Ottomans of Turkey. Um, and then I got very lucky for a change. I found six imperial orders uh, by Murad III, the Sultan of Ottoman Turkey issued against Kulbadan, asking her to go back home a year into her arrival. Um, and she didn't. So she did not infuriate just one uh, Muslim monarch, she infuriated actually two of them. And that's the story and that's the scandal. Why she infuriated them, I'm not going to tell you just now. <laughs> Thank you, Ruby. <laughs> Alison, do you want to sort of reflect on the source material and maybe also what, what role the imagination is playing for you in, in your work with this? Yes, um, very much. I mean, I'm very struck by the richness of your sources, Ruby, um, by comparison with the utter paucity of my own. I mean, there are these 11 poems, which, you know, we can date, but it takes a long time to work out that argument. Um, but otherwise, unlike, uh, you know, any, any other Roman woman or Greek woman who's had a biography, she, Sulpicia is not mentioned by anybody else. She does not, nobody seems to know her poetry. Um, only in the last 10 years are people starting to investigate whether later poets actually quote her poems. So I'm really working with um, some documentary sources about her family members. We know a lot about her uncle, Masala. Uh, we have um, lots of textual evidence, lots of documentary sources, inscriptions, things like that. Um, we have some Roman wall painting that is contemporary with 
the, the, the kind of poetry that she writes and that shows us some quite risque or erotic, seductive, flirtatious scenes between women and men. Um, and they're found in what look like the very highest class architectural settings. So there's archeological material, there's Roman painting and a tradition of that. Um, there's also, um, yeah, what I, <laughs> oh, there's actually a lot of imagination that has to go into drawing all of that together to create the context for someone writing Latin poetry. There's tons of Latin erotic poetry in this period. It's all written by men with Roman names to women with Greek names. And she reverses that, um, those tropes uh, completely. So I'm interested in what happens, um, yeah, when a woman speaks in a, a male voice and how much that actually overturns gendered conventions and how much it reinforces them at the same time. You know, what struck me um, as, as you two were speaking was some of how, how these issues come up in medieval literature too, you know, and uh, just to touch lightly on, the, on a few of them, the male disbelief, right? Um, there, there have been scholars who have argued that Heloise did not write her letters to Abelard, you know, and um, I, I think that's pr been pretty <laughs> thoroughly, um, thoroughly debunked. And, and if anything, it seems that Heloise's convent uh, actually preserved Abelard's work uh, for posterity. So she has, a, if anything, the, a quite large role. Um, but, you know, there was this kind of knee jerk um, erasure, really, that even when you had a substantial um, intellectual product from a, from a woman, in her in her voice signed by her and so on um that it must not really be by her because how could a woman be that sophisticated um also very strange understanding of history um attached to that you know in which women in the past are less educated than than women in the present you know um at least in medieval europe it doesn't work quite that way uh but uh i think the other the other figure that that came to mind were the other two figures were Marie de France and Marjorie Kemp, because with Marie de France, we have this poet who's a superb poet, but we don't really know anything about her. There have been various theories about her identity. She's mentioned, she names herself um, in one of her works. Um, and she's mentioned, or someone, a Marie is mentioned in other, in a few other contemporary works. Um, so it seems that there is a poet Marie figure, but if we're very, very rigorous about it, we don't even know if these are the same Marie, you know, or if it's a, a kind of poet figure who's, who's being imagined. Um, and of course, uh, and Mar yes, go ahead, Ruby. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I no, no, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, Actually, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, what Alison and you said actually is the crux of the problem, right, which is this utter and, you know, what I want to say, severe disbelief. So, um, you know, just, just for a second, although we, I had these 83 folios, these magnificent folios, you know, uh, historians completely forgot uh, that this is the sole example of prose writing, not only from the Mughal world, but from the entire Islamic court culture of the 16th century. Women always wrote poetry, right? Um, and it's it. She breaks. I mean, this 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 is something I wrote quite a lot studying the genre. There was no model for it, and it was not replicated. And she really broke from the existing genres, which were which were essentially. Uh, panegyric, uh, you know, they, they, they were almost always king centered, almost always writing about, you know, the great action. So if you look at, you know, the men who wrote alongside her as a contribution to the supposed contribution to the Akbar Nama, it's completely Akbar centered. Whereas this book is talking about, her book is talking about women on the move, deaths of children the constant negotiations that take place in war zones, female, uh, you know, fanticide, uh, the negotiations of older women with uh, the monarchs, of the older women with the younger women, of the younger women with the monarchs, right? And contemporary historians, the, 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 it's really interesting, repeatedly, they say things like, you know, she gets her dates wrong. 
And I want to say to them, you know, do you even begin to understand what chronicling means? I was speaking about this the other day in relationship to Noor's uh, husband's recording. That's actually a stream of consciousness, right, style. These are not diaries of the modern time where they're dating things, where there are. But to me, the interesting question is also, uh, so this insistence that I get, even when, you know, Alison, you're absolutely right, in, the, in Noor's world, it's succulent, the, the, um, the um, you know, the source material from visual to textual to panegyric to letters to coins to you name it. Uh, and it still took 2018 to bring out the first really serious biography because there is that disbelief. And, you know, I mentioned this the other day, you know, with, with that most formidable painting that we discussed of her loading the musket, which is the first serious portrait, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the one scholar said to me, isn't this representation? And I, you know, of course turned around and said, well, which one of this is not representation? So that's a very interesting, I, I, I suppose the thing I want to say is that in the end, it's a question of what our practices are, right? I mean, I, and I love that process. I want to ask you both a kind of follow-up question, which is a little bit of a twist on this, because we're, we're, we're talking about later erasure of these women or an inability to see them. But, and I know this is a little bit based on some of your work in, in Empress Ruby, um, but I think it's also, it holds in a lot of cases. To what extent um, is it sometimes difficult to understand these women or to get to get close to them because of other archetypes or stereotypes that are standing in the way. So not so much erasure per se, not invisibility, but other models or, or ways of thinking that um, that take over. I mean, Alison, are you seeing that in your in, in your work on Sulpicia? Or? Absolutely. I mean, on the one hand, it's a Roman woman reusing all the tropes of erotic, elegiac love. Um, but as the active lover rather than the uh, pursued, right, or and bought and paid for beloved. Um, so um, there's a great deal of uh, mistrust amongst male historians and literary historians that women could even actively choose their own erotic interests, right? So there's there's that. Um, and and then there's this interesting way in which, um, her Romanness is called into question, even though she signs herself with a very Roman name, um, because every other comparandum is a Greek courtesan figure, right? And so someone without citizenship um, or someone suffering um, legal disabilities as an infamous and things like that. So on the level of an actress or something like that. Um, and because she writes about sex, that's what um, many male critics see when they look at her is sex and they just cannot reconcile, right? Um, a woman of the upper classes in ancient Rome who was subject to laws about whom she could marry, whom she could not marry, et cetera, et cetera, whom she could talk to, um, being able to speak openly, even in you know, the confines of an upper class home where you, know, you can kind of figure out where you can speak openly and where you can't. Thank you. Ruby? Um, yeah, um, I think, I think um, so, so in the case of Noor Jahan, uh, you know, um, the practices of erasure actually begin within, within her, her own moment in some senses. And I think the moment is uh, you know, for her admirers and people who really were in awe, um, having coins in her name, all technical signs of sovereignty were great. Even, you know, one of the most formidable that is hunting killer tigers was great. But towards the end of her life, uh, one of the, uh, towards the end of her husband's life, rather, one of the um, uh, officers uh, captures the emperor. Uh, it's a it's a huge uh, you know faction fighting, but he captures the emperor for a hundred days, and she uh, she battles. She 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 gets on a um, elephant and actually battles. Um, it's a ferocious battle. She's defeated. She strategizes him again. Uh, strategizes again, and then releases gets the emperor released after a hundred day activity. 
that is the beginning in the chronicles, uh, particularly of our stepson, uh, beginning of the use of a term, it's called fitna, which essentially, and it's an Islamic concept, uh, which was for the first time used um, for Prophet Muhammad's beloved wife, Aisha, when she got on to uh, the so-called battle of the camel, in which she was fighting, you know, this is, this is the story of succession and she actually went on war. Um, and so, you know, um, military is just so male that this is not acceptable. So Noor has come to be cast as, um, you know, the sensoing, chaotic, um, you know, all of these kind of charges come to be. And then of course the history kind of builds. There's a colonial charge, typically she's orientalized, she's sexualized. Then later on, I was mentioning this love story uh, in the 19th century. It truncates her biography. So there is some sense of her power, but people really, um, it's not a palpable sense of power, right? And it's about her power that I, I wanted to write. With Gulbadan, it's a, it, it seems to me it's, it's, a, it's a, very, um, a very dangerous ground historians are on in creating a hierarchy of, of sources, if you will, right? that, you know, the, the so what constitutes the canon, anything. Uh, and this is a very state-sponsored nationalist kind of idea that only when the state is involved does a document matter. And, you know, everywhere I think feminist work has been against writing the state, right? Poetry matters, letters matter, visuality matters, women's accounts matter. So I think I think uh, the question of erasure is a rather different one in this in this instance for me. Thank you, and um, you know we have another question from Christine. Um, textiles matter from Kate. Yes, and the body matters. <laughs> yes, bodies matter. <laughs> um, and please go on. You know, if you're listening in, and uh, you're probably as wrapped as I am, but. Uh, please feel free to, to pop your questions into the chat. I have another one from Christine, which was for Allison, but I think we can sort of ask it more broadly because um, it, it applies to both your projects. She, she asks, um, you know, following on, on Supicia's comments on city life, do you think the city is more conducive to female creation than the countryside or vice versa? But maybe we could broaden that question to sort of ask about place and, and movement and literary creation. And again, I have Marjorie Kemp, my current favorite, um, who, who is such a traveler, you know, who, and whose book um, of her life has, has so much to do with her pilgrimages and her trips to Cologne and to Rome and to, and to Jerusalem. Um, and there's a long history of that in Europe, of Nigeria, you know, the woman who writes who writes the, the pilgrimage account. Um, maybe Alison, we could start with you. Um, what relationship are you seeing between place and, and, and women's creation or women's writing? Right. I mean, that poem that I put up actually is arguing against leaving, asks her uncle not to leave the city. She wants to be in the urban environment where, where things are more exciting, right? Rather than to be taken to the sort of seclusion of the countryside, the loneliness of the countryside, um, and the boredom, I think, of the of the countryside. There's a lot more to do in a city, and I think that's really that's a pretty contemporary view as well. Um, journeys were difficult in classical antiquity, right? They were troublesome to everybody. There was, I mean, the the conveyances were very uncomfortable, and moving between um, town and and the the rustic villa was um, also dangerous. There were, you know, brigands and such um, on the high the highways, on the Roman roads, some of which still survive. So you can see how how good and how wretched some of those roads are even now. So the other thing is that um, it could just be an elegiac trope. Elegy is set in the city. It's urban, sophisticated. Um, sexy poetry it's and you can only prosecute your affair in the city too you can't do it in the countryside so there's a whole lot of ways in which the literary genre informs the the content on display so the original sex in the city i guess i couldn't help that i'm sorry 
<laughs> Ruby, I know travel features features a great deal in 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 both uh, Gulbadan and and Nur, um, Nur's lives. Um, are you seeing a relationship between? I mean, we don't have to limit it to writing too, into architecture or there are other there are other kinds of creation or or acts of power. I think. Um... I think this is this is something um, people used to ask me how did so just for those who don't know Noor Jahan, um, she was the 20th and last wife of the fourth um, great Mughal of India man called Jahangir. Um, she was married before with a daughter, uh, but not from the royal family and rises to be his his co sovereign so therefore the only uh, woman Mughal ruler amongst the great Mughals of India. Um, I, the, the question for me was, and of course I tried to answer this in many ways, you know, how people used to ask me, how did she become possible, right? A very legitimate question. And uh, because he had these, you know, formidable other wives and there were other matriarchs, we've been talking about Gulbaran, very different, but nonetheless great sort of senses of power. Um, and I, uh, the, 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 the connecting dots are really this, um, that her husband, husband and, and, and she, the emperor and she, uh, are the most, the Mughals always remained peripatetic. They always moved through the country, right? One way or another, each of them. But she and Jahangir were the most peripatetic couples. So one of the things I did was to really chart and show where all, you know, the, 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 the royal camp went, how did they live, what was happening here. And I really do believe uh, and Jahangir was, of course, contesting precisely this harem making of his father, right? And he, he, he designed himself to be a very different kind of monarch, uh, not least in that he started writing his own memoirs, unlike his father who commissions this, you know, these imperial histories. So I believe that uh, Noor's rise to power had something to do with being back in the, in the tented environment. And we mustn't forget she was born on the road. I mean, you know, this is this is a girl who's, who's very much experienced in that. Um, and um, so I've been thinking very hard, um, you know, about Gulbadan's journey in that context, right? Uh, of course, she comes back four and a half years later, even if she doesn't want to come back, she's brought back. And it's from the palace that, you know, she begins this new journey, which is to, which is to write. So, so um, you know, there's, 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 but, but, um, being peripatetic or itinerant um, is just such a bigger ethics. You know, that's what I'm trying to think. What did it mean? Not just simply, I want to be out of the house and I want to be on the road, but it's um, charting, what did people do? So I uh, began, I, I studied these histories of, from other places of, of women who went to, went to Western Arabia ostensibly for, for pilgrimage. There was a case of this glorious 14th century Egyptian queen who travels with this whole caravan and they have this amazing record that, you know, there's this, the kitchen that she, she's on a 40 day journey and they wanted to make sure that she had the best cheeses and the loveliest herbs. And, you know, she, so she kept on looking. But also there's this whole tradition called Mujambir, essentially sojourners, right? Uh, who, who did a whole range of things. People did things like, they took measurements of the grand buildings. They met in uh, Sufi lodges. Um, you know, they went and studied with people sometimes. They would just break the journey and go and study. So, so it, it's, it's a charting of this tradition of um, what's happening in the mind? These are journeys both of the body and the mind. Um, you know, um, one of one of the things that I wondered about, both as you were speaking and as I read your book, was specifically the um, the issue of being a, a migrant, right? Because um, Noor comes from somewhere else, and I know in your book you sort of emphasize how the cultural commonalities and how her father understood the, the mores and understood how to behave at court and so on. But you know, I think of um, well, Marie de France, who we assume was active in England, therefore was you know from France. Um, in the eighth century, we have um, seventh and eighth centuries. We have uh, women who are uh, nuns in England who go to uh, continental Germany, 
what's now Germany, um, and uh, essentially work in monasteries there and are writing letters back home to Boniface. And so we have this cultural production of women who are away from home. Um, and, and that sort of becomes the, um, the spur, if you will, for, um, for writing and, and often the subject of it too, you know, missing people, missing, um, you know, the, the sense of loss and, and the, um, that's, that's so present in the, in the letters of, of these English women. Um, so I wonder, you know, that, that would be sort of a secondary question to what extent actually being a stranger in a strange land um, has maybe, I guess, a little less for Sopicia, though there might be other examples of that that are relevant there. Um, are Greek women more active in, in certain ways, or do we have do we have evidence of that, Alison? This is a question from utter ignorance. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot more Greek um, female writers who are extant. Um, in the period in which Sulpicia is uh, writing, what we have, we do have lots of, you know, perhaps Greek women, um, certainly enslaved persons, signing their names in there mm -hmm. and leaving them uh, as funerary epitaphs, and just the name. And presumably those are the names that the women chose for themselves that are a Greek name, the name of enslavement and a Latin name, which is the name of their um, manumission, I suppose, and the, the badge of their freedom, as it were. Um, and we don't have any writing as far as I know from those Greek women, even though we know <laughs> that some of them were in fact uh, trained readers and scribes, and we have um, some of them will put on their funerary epitaph, not just their name, Corinna, but also their uh, household position, Libraria. Yeah. So we do know they are working, you know, they are working in literate ways, but we just don't have the traces of, wow. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just going to say, um, you know, um, so the so the world that I'm studying by the time her her uncle Gulbadan's uncle has, uh, you know, he he has this absolutely magnificent atelier. So there's a lot of painting. There's a lot of, and these manuscripts, of course, survive, right? Um, like Alison, like you, the, the, there's always been a question: Did we have women painters, right? Um, and people, uh, so relating this to con convention, for instance. Uh, painters typically never, uh, you know, left their signatures on these paintings. So are we to assume that women did paint, which is very unlikely, right? Uh, and then there's also this kind of relationship to the to the bound book, which I find very, very interesting. Um, can I just share one extraordinary image um, that exists in the, the, it's in the Chester Beatty Library. Um, and this has been, established that this is um, a suggestive Gulbadan holding the book. Um, it's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is the British Library. There's another one in the Chester Beatty Library. Um, but it's, it's just the, um, it's just the code. Uh, and, you know, I want to relate to the, um, Adrian Ritz said very beautifully, I actually wrote this down, if I may, just pull this out, just sitting here waiting for you. Um, she says this um, quite powerfully that, um, that she closely watches, quote, uh, and this is her quote, for symbolic arrangements, decoding difficult and complex messages to, to messages left to us by women of the past. And this is such an extraordinary um, code for me. Um, Here she is. Um, and actually the image is uh, part of the production of the uh, history of her nephew at Barnama. Um, and this is a scene that's actually taken from what she writes in the book. Um, and I just think it's very suggestive um, for, for a variety of reasons. I mean, one is that a bound manuscript uh, like a religious text or portrait, um, usually of um, uh, you know, leading ruler or saint was a precious object 
both materially and uh, as a valuable repository of memory, memory or, or spiritual meaning. And so paintings of people carrying such precious objects uh, were there all the time in this, in this, in this world. So here you see uh, the great Mughal painter Kesudas, um, you know, with his own um, bound uh, miniatures. Uh, this may be familiar to some, or painted by this man of Father uh, Xavier. Um, and he was a Jesuit missionary to the, to the, to the Mughal court uh, and a nephew of St. Francis Xavier. And so uh, this is the tradition uh, that, that we are talking about here of holding. If I may just share a, a very different image here, um, just, just simply to reflect on the idea of holding. Um, here we have Noor Jahan. This is the Cleveland Museum of Art contemporary Noor Jahan holding the image of Jahangir. And we have her husband holding the image of his father, Akbar the Great. This is in, in, in Louvre. So, uh, so I think there's just, so I was just, um, as Alison was talking, I was thinking about these kinds of codes that are, that are embedded in these, uh, you know, in these texts, um, you know, like the, 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 the fragment that you were referring to earlier on. And I believe that, you know, there's no other way except working with these fragments. Um, that's, um, that's so fascinating. And that was, just to be clear, that was Gulbadan in the green. Yes, uh, that was Gulbadan in red. In the image with um, the, fir the first with image the book. with the book. Yes, and yeah. the later image is Noor Jahan with the, yeah. She's but it's, the Empress. <laughs> it's interesting because in that image, there's a woman across from her who's holding a child. And that's yes. kind of an interesting. Yes, and that's picture. baby Akbar. <laughs> <laughs> her nephew, the baby who becomes this formidable emperor. Um, you know, we only, we have a few minutes and um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, it's a, in a way, it's a very classic question, but I think it's worth asking, especially, you know, when we, when we have these conversations about, um, about sources and in certain situations where we have really exceptional women who are really one of a kind in their, um, in their environments, or maybe one of two, one of two um, comparable, uh, comparable figures. What would you say, you know, what assumptions about the cultures that they come from do the studying these women force us to rethink? I, mean, the, I, I understand that I've asked the question that we could spend a couple of years talking about, <laughs> but what pops to mind right now? What, um, you know, what does looking at Gulbadan or Nur Jahan or Sulpicia, what do they ask us to sort of think about again or, or reconsider? I'll let whoever wants to go first. Go <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think they ask us to think precisely about who gets to speak, uh, both in public and sort of historically, who who sets the record. Um, is there a way of setting it straight, of of troubling the straightness of it? I mean, I guess that I think that uh, those are some of the big questions for me. And why is it, even Sappho, we have her poetry because men quote it, cite it, um, talk about her, everything that we have, we have that, it, we have it coming through. Um, it's already shaped and framed by male reception, let's say. Let me, Alison, let me, let me keep you for a moment because there was a follow-up. There was a question from Christine too, which I think is, is a perfect follow-up. Why, why do you think, I mean, do you have a sort of working theory for why we, we have more from Sappho than from Sulpicia? Why is, why is Sulpicia more forgotten than Sappho? Right, uh, Sappho, like Sulpicia, was a member of um, a very prominent aristocratic family, but I think that there was a different place for girls poetry, music, dance, and the training in poetry, music, and dance in the early, the archaic Greek world um, than there was in, in Sulpicia's day. When the emperor was um, 
was interfering in the nation's bedrooms when the emperor was taking it upon himself to be the pater patriae and to legislate about who could sleep with whom, who could marry whom, et cetera, et cetera. In Sappho's day, she was very famous and people sent their daughters to her to learn how to dance and how to perform. And when, and you know, the choruses of girls dancing and singing girls in ancient Greece, though those they performed at festivals and that was a way um, to be showcased for marriage, I think. Um, and because she was of such high social class and so publicly training people, I think that um, this bled into male, aristocratic male um, education where they learned to sing songs and symposia with one another and they might learn some songs of hers as well. And then she's collected by the male librarians in Alexandria. Um, and passed on that way. And we actually, we have two sort of almost complete poems, both of which are quoted by male sort of literary critics. Um, one is an example of the sublime <laughs> and one of them is translated by Catullus and so on and so forth. So, which is interesting, right? Ventriloquizing the female. Similar educational phenomena in 17th century England actually with song and dance as, as education for school, for women, Ruby. Um, you know, I, I, I just think that, um, so one is this, um, you know, the codes that women leave behind. This really fascinates me because there are all these very interesting codes that are left behind. So we have to, we have to break our habitual patterns in some, some ways, challenge ourselves and sort of, you know, look at things differently. Um, but I also think that, you know, this thing that you were mentioning, exceptional women, you know, a handful. Um, it's such a modern fabrication, because if you begin to think about the creativity and the play, right, and as the three of us have gone, uh, you know, we become fascinated by certain figures. Uh, and I think within our own records, if we became fascinated by just one other name, you know, I have no doubt that it would lead to something else as, as you know, um, you know, it doesn't have to be Sappho, it has to be somebody else. Uh, so going after this kind of, you know, fragmentary poem, the challenge of the sexual encounter, right? Um, I also tend to lean towards um, lawbreakers. You know, I really like subversive women. I think it's just fantastic to go after them. And they call out in a way, if you believe that they call out, then they call out. So, so that's, that's what I think. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question before I hold you, Ruby, to your promise to, <laughs> to reveal <laughs> Gulbadan's reason for not coming home, not wanting to come home. Um, but, you know, Tamara asks if, because um, this comes up in, in her work and she wonders if it does in yours, do you ever struggle with certain details, for example, pertaining to sexual violence or forms of suffering these women may have not wanted revealed? How do we balance the desire for detail over respect for the dead. Is that something that's come up in either of your work? I'm gonna to defer to Ruby here. Um, I mean, it's a question we must ask ourselves, right? I mean, because with all the um, creative forces, the constructivist um, gestures, uh, you know, we are also, I mean, the reason why we, we are not, we're not just fabricating this, there's this very serious adherence to, um, to, 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 to what we have, to the fragment. Uh, but, you know, if you think about the fragment seriously, and of course, people have written about this, feminists have written, post-colonial scholars have written, fragment is not just a line, it's, or a, or a paragraph, or a, for a, or a little code. Uh, you know, fragment is something that actually challenges the, 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 the very status of the dominant. That's the point. Uh, and I think that's the relationship I'm interested in. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you take context, for example, that, that Alison was mentioning, uh, contexts are not created, they're based out of something, uh, but they come in the forefront that, 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 that begins to actually really animate uh, the life of these people, there always will be a gap, right? So to imagine that we can just somehow, uh, you know, 
tell you about the so-called first of all philosophically i think this is such a problem to even um uh, to even expect from yourself that there'll be a true gulbadan or a true uh, you know sappho or a, or a true antigone uh, i'm not going to go near alison's character because i know we are very protective right so um so I, you know that's not the premise from which i i i personally speaking function i think i think i'm not interested in the truth but i'm definitely interested in truth effects right i think that's the point if that makes sense so speaking of which ruby what do you think why do you think ulbadan did not want to go back she um she did not want to go back so uh, you know so you you really <laughs> asking me the <clears throat> the juicy part of the book which is also the historical document backed um uh, you know part of the book essentially i mentioned that uh, you know anbar was really thrilled to let her go because the millennial was coming and one of the really big gestures was to send somebody from the royal family who would go perform the pilgrimage on the emperor's behalf at this time uh, western arabia was uh, under the sovereignty of uh, the ottomans of turkey Uh, and they too never came to to western arabia because essentially an emperor like the mughal could never leave his own homeland he had to be there physically um and so one of the ways in which the ottoman um, sovereign uh, declared and and legitim legitimized his own sovereignty was by protecting the rights of pilgrimage and pilgrims uh in all of western arabia which meant giving huge amounts of contribution cash monetary um non monetary all kinds of things uh so when akbar when she when gulbadan comes from agra she bears huge amount of bounty she's a very rich woman i mean there's documentation of how much she brings along so it was okay to give some amount as designated but she stayed on and she began to disperse arms literally stepping upon the steps of murad the third and these are the six long orders that he issues describing all this saying you know this is what she is doing and this is an islamic um and so scandal not in our modern senses of the term but scandal in the sense of really overstepping the authority of the Uh, of the of the lord of western arabia by doing something that establishes his very uh, sovereignty and she didn't want to go back essentially because i think um this is documentarily i cannot establish but this is um uh i would say a very informed guess uh, which is that you know this is back to the uh, vagabond life this is back to engagement with nature to engagement with places and spaces you know it doesn't mean that she lives uh, in the open she is living in these gorgeous tented places in um state sponsored inns uh, but it's the it's the freeing of the senses she didn't want to be enclosed again enclosed again yeah yeah Thank you both so much. Thank you Alison, thank you Ruby. This has been such a rich conversation and I'm I'm so glad we we met digitally and I I hope we can meet soon in person as well. And thank you also to everyone who's who's joined us via Zoom. Um I hope you enjoyed this and uh you know once it's online you can share it with your friends and fellow scholars. Um and I wish you all a good evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. It's been a delight. Thank you. Great to see everyone in person again. <laughs> Bye-bye.